Hello, everybody. Welcome into the Fantasy Pros Football Podcast. I'm Ryan Warmly, joined today by Derek Brown and by Pat Fitzmorris. Fellas, it is week one. We are two days away from real NFL football. Yes, Debra, I called it real football. The preseason does not count. We are two days away from actual professional football. And I'm so excited. Debra, you were just telling us before we started recording that you're almost done with the week one primer. Yeah, man, I got a numero dos. I got two games left. And then outside of updates and accounting for injury stuff, it will be in the rear view, man. And woo, talk about knocking the rust off uh, on Labor Day weekend, getting back into the throes of writing that. Fitz knows what I'm talking about because he was, uh, you know, crushing the waiver wire article for week one. So, you know, we're, we're knocking rust off here, boys. Week one's ready. Let's go. <laughs> Fitz, how excited are you that we're back? I mean, there's nothing really like the anticipation of those couple of days before the first game of the season. I know, man. Um, still got a couple more drafts left to knock out before, I think, down to two. Um, that's good. But and, and then, Worm, we get games on Thursday and Friday. So it is going to be a nice build up to that first NFL Sunday. Uh, good couple of days coming coming up. So we should all be savoring this. They're, they're great games, too. I mean, not only Ravens-Chiefs, mm-hmm. obviously, but Packers-Eagles is super fun as well. So a couple of really exciting games to kick things off. We're going to have, I think I mentioned this last week, but just for those who missed it, we're going to have something close to our usual weekly podcast lineup this week. We're not doing some of that early week stuff. Obviously, we didn't have you know a show on Monday on Labor Day, and, and today's show is a little bit different than it will be on most Tuesdays. Um, but we're going to, in the back half of this week, have kind of that more normal getting into the ranks show and the start sit. We're going to have our key questions show with the three of us on Friday. So back half of this week will look normal. And then starting next week will be kind of our same weekly lineup that you'll get throughout the rest of the season. So uh, really looking forward to all that and to, to diving in. And it's always a difficult transition to go from draft mode to actual weekly rankings mode, but it's also a super fun time of year as well. Quick reminder for everybody. All of our 2024 consensus rankings and tiers can be found at fantasypros.com slash rankings. Also, the winner of Trophy Smack's teeny tiny loser mini belt giveaway is Stink Mangioni. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Please get in touch with our customer support agents at mailbag at fantasypros.com with your mailing address and proof of your subscription to the Fantasy Pros YouTube channel. We will get that shipped out to you. Again, the winner is Stink Mangioni, which I suppose is a fitting name for a teeny tiny loser mini belt giveaway. Congratulations to Stink. We've also teamed up with our friends at Trophy Smack to give away something truly epic this week, a large fantasy football wall smack of your choosing these magnetic metal wall plaques aren't just wall art they're statement pieces that let everyone know how passionate you are about fantasy football whether you go with the sleek floating style or the bold poster style wall smack is the perfect addition to your fan cave to enter all you need to do is subscribe to the fantasy pros youtube channel right now drop a comment below on any of our videos And that's it. We will be announcing a winner right here on the channel. So make sure to turn on those notifications so you can know when new videos are up and to claim your prize. All right, fellas, we figured as sort of our last off-season off season show here, excuse me. Uh, I'm shaking off the rust too. Uh, we're going to talk about some bold predictions. We're going to go through five from each of you in a countdown style, five to one from both of you, and just kind of try and be bold and say, hey, here's where what we think is going to happen this year. And, uh, you know, we're going to, there's there's varying degrees of boldness in your guys' takes. We'll kind of get into that as as we go through. I think they're largely pretty good though, and uh, and yeah, we'll see. Uh, maybe the fans will agree with some. Maybe they'll disagree with some. Let's start off with you, D bro. Your number five bold prediction for the season. Well, I have waxed poetic the entire off season about how high I am on the Seattle Seahawks passing attack. Well, this all has to come back to their quarterback, and so I'm going to sit here and tell everybody that Chef Gino will be a top 10 fantasy quarterback yet again in 2024. We've already seen him do this once, people. 2022, QB8 and fantasy points per game. And I know everybody that invested last year, they're all saying, it went terribly last year. Yes, it did. And that was specifically because of how bad their offensive line was and how much pressure Geno was under. And I think that we get better blocking up front, so I'm going to throw that out there first. But... I mean, unfortunately, Geno had to deal with the fifth highest pressure rate allowed in the NFL last year. When he got clean pockets, he was still awesome last year. In clean pockets, we're talking about a quarterback that was fifth best in yards per attempt, had the highest big-time throw rate in the NFL, and fifth in passing grade. 
So if he gets more clean pockets and we get better usage from these wide receivers, yes, I'm staring at JSN and we're not going to talk about the screen merchant role that he was put in last year, although I am bringing it up here. If we get better usage for the wide receivers, we get better blocking up front. I think Geno Smith can be a top 12 fantasy quarterback. I'm also going to double down and say he's going to be top 10. Not even discussing yet the type of offense that Ryan Grubb is going to run when we're going to get more passing volume, downfield shots. Chef Geno, prepare to cook again in 2024. They're also just going to run more plays. Like, and that's mm -hmm. great for fantasy score. Like, even, you know, regardless of how efficient they are or whether those are big plays or small plays, running more plays is good. Like, objectively, they're just going to have more opportunity to accumulate fantasy points for us. I've been really very interested in Gino as in the formats and the leagues where I'm getting a backup quarterback. He's been my backup quarterback of choice in a lot of these formats. I really like being aggressive on him. So I love this take. Deaver, obviously, you know, not necessarily ranking him in the top 10. And I think that's what mm -hmm. makes it a bold prediction. But I, I love this as kind of planting your flag on Gino as a guy to target this year. Fitz, what are you doing with Gino Smith this season? Yeah, he's been one of those guys. I've I've got a lot of quarterbacks ranked in low end QB two range who I could see plausible upside for, including uh, Baker Mayfield, Daniel Jones, um, but I just like I haven't been able to get him above like QB twenty four. But Debro makes a great case here, and one of the the unheralded things that he brought up early is the health of their offensive line, and I know last year they did not. Um, they, they got some missed games out of what Charles Cross and, and Abraham Lucas, their bookend pair of young tackles. Like if those guys stay healthy, the pass protection is going to be a lot better this year. Debra, where do you have Gino ranked? I do have him inside the top 24. I've actually got him at 20. So I am a little yep. ahead of consensus on him. I've got him at 20, and I think the conversation for him starts as high as QB 17. Um, I can say this and. I just went through and my first run of week one rankings is live on fantasypros.com. Uh, for week one, I've got him at QB 18 too, but he's in a long tier of guys where like, I know everybody's healthy right now and outside of like deeper leagues or super flex leagues, like people are not going to worry about Geno Smith in week one. But again, if you're in a super flex league and you're kind of parsing between, am I starting Geno? Am I starting Aaron Rodgers, Matthew Stafford, like, Gino, I've got above all of those guys. I got him at QB 18, and I think I could even push him higher, depending. Fitz, let's stick with the quarterback position for your number five bold prediction. Michael Penix is the Falcons' starting quarterback by the end of October. Um, Kirk Cousins has become this sacred cow in the fantasy football world because he's put up consistently respectable numbers. Um, I would contend that Cousins is a much better fantasy quarterback than real-life quarterback. Uh, so in other words, I, I think Kirk Cousins is kind of overrated. And um, one, one of my closest friends attended the University of Minnesota a long time ago. Um, I visited him often and made friends with a lot of his friends who are native Minnesotans. And um, those people are friends of mine to this day. They were not head over heels in love with Kirk Cousins during his run with the Vikings. And I think Cousins was a very polarizing figure with Vikings fans. Um Pretty poor record for Cousins in big games, uh, primetime games, playoff games, etc. And if I had a dollar for every time I have seen Kirk Cousins throw short of the sticks in third and long situations, I would take both of you fellas out for a nice steak dinner with uh, good wine and all the trimmings. Mm -hmm. So um, Cousins is 36. He's coming off a torn Achilles. The Falcons spent a top 10 pick on Michael Penix Jr. And he is unquestionably their quarterback of the future. Yes, the Falcons paid Kirk Cousins a lot of money in the short run, but what if Cousins struggled? Like, here's something interesting. Did you guys know that the only team with shorter odds to win their division than the Falcons are last year's Super Bowl teams, the Chiefs and 49ers? That's it. The Falcons have very short odds. So expectations are high in Atlanta. And if this team underachieves, Early on, because the offense isn't meeting expectations, I could totally see the Falcons throwing Kirk Cousins overboard and going with their rocket-armed rookie. And in fact, I, I think it will happen. I mean, the Falcons protected Penix in the preseason. They know he's good and how important he is to the franchise. We're going to see Penix take over as Atlanta's starting quarterback before Halloween. Debro, if Penix does take over as a starting quarterback, what does that do for the skill position players? Because you have been very aggressive on all of them, on Bijan, on Drake London, especially on Kyle Pitts as well. What would Penix starting do for those guys? 
I think depending on how well he would play as the starting quarterback, maybe it takes a little bit of the high-end ceiling in terms of how many total touchdowns maybe we can project for this offense scoring. Maybe that kind of you know splits hairs between do you go Brees, do you go Bijan right now in drafts? Where are we going to see Drake London finish the year? Is it as a wide receiver one or a top 20 wide receiver? Things like that. So I think it would just split hairs as far as like looking at the overall touchdown scored for the offense as a whole. Um, but again, that's that's if Penix doesn't hit the ground running and he's an awesome. So you play out the bull case for him and he, you know, I'm not going to say he's this year CJ Stroud. I mean, that because that's insane. But um, if he's just good, this offense is still consolidated enough that even with Penix under center, we know he's not going to run. They're going to throw. The offense probably looks very similar as to what we would expect with Kirk Cousins. So I wouldn't move them down a ton. Fitz, not just thinking about this, you know, the skill position guys. Where would you rank Michael Penix if he's the starter? Pretty similarly to where I'm ranking Cousins, mid range quarterback, too. I mean, he's got a rocket arm and he's going to make all the passing game components go if he does, in fact, replace Cousins at some point. NFL Week 1 is here, and a new season means new ways to get in on the action at DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of the NFL. Fans have spoken. We want to bet on touchdowns. DraftKings heard us and is delivering. DraftKings Sportsbook is the number one place to bet touchdowns. Ready to place your first bet? Try betting on something simple, like picking a player to score a touchdown. It all kicks off Thursday night with my Ravens taking on the two-time defending Super Bowl champion Chiefs in Kansas City with the Chiefs laying a field goal at home. The Ravens are looking for revenge after getting upset in Baltimore last January. Two of the three best quarterbacks in football squaring off with a total at 46.5 on DraftKings. Obviously, you'll all be watching that amazing season opener, but are you planning to do a touchdown dance of your own? New DraftKings customers bet $5 to get $250 in bonus bets instantly, plus one month of NFL Plus Premium on us. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app and use code FANTASYPROS. That's code FANTASYPROS for new customers to get $250 in bonus bets when you bet just 5 bucks and get one month of NFL Plus Premium on us. Offer ends September 19th only on DraftKings. The crown is yours. All right, Fitz, let's start with you this time. What is your number four bold prediction? Nico Collins scores fewer fantasy points than both Stefan Diggs and Tank Dell. Nico is the wide, rece- wide receiver three on his own team. Um, Nico's ECR and ADP have kind of confounded me all offseason. Um, the Texans signed Stefan Diggs, who averaged 111 catches, 1,343 yards, and 9.3 touchdowns during his four years in Buffalo. And yet Nico is still being regarded as this high end wide receiver, too. Um, And I realized Stefan Diggs really kind of fell off a cliff late last season from week 10 through the end of the year, including the Bills two playoff games. Diggs averaged 42.2 receiving yards per game and only 5.3 yards per target. Terrible numbers. But that downturn basically coincided with the promotion of uh, Joe Brady to offensive coordinator for the Bills after the firing of Ken Dorsey. So maybe Diggs just wasn't a good fit for what Brady wanted to do. Um, Diggs is 30, so age is maybe a mild concern, but we're probably a couple of seasons away from an age-related decline. The Texans also have Tank Dell. And Debro, I know you are a big Tank Dell fan. We also know that C.J. Stroud is a big Tank Dell fan because he has gone out of his way to talk up Tank Dell at basically every opportunity. Um, And look, Dell's going to make some big plays for this team, even if he does come off the field in two wide receiver sets. So Nico is facing some major target competition, and he is coming off a season in which his efficiency was just through the roof. 16.2 yards per catch, 11.9 yards per target, 3.11 yards per route run. Those numbers are insanely good. Uh, So good that they're probably unrepeatable. And look, I I love Nico. I think he's a great player. I love what a beast he is in contested catch situations and what a bully he is with the ball in his hands, just batting away would-be tacklers. Um, But I realize those efficiency numbers are going to dip. They're probably still going to be well above average because he's good, but I don't think what he did last year is repeatable. Regression is coming for Collins. I think Stefan Diggs is going to lead the the Houston Texans in targets this year. I mean, like – he was brought in, I think, to be the alpha, and Dell is going to make his share of big plays. I think Nico might be the third best fantasy receiver on his own team. 
I, I'm buying the idea that maybe Nico is overvalued because of the target competition, and we shouldn't just say, oh, this guy was so good last year, he's the alpha in the offense, because there are other mouths to feed. It's harder for me to buy that he would actually be wide receiver three. Of course, that's what makes it bold. Debra, what do you think about this one? Um, I, I, I get the stand by Fitz here. I mean, I disagree with it because I've been high on Nico the entire offseason and what he did when the entire offense basically condensed around him last year. I will say that this is still one of the biggest questions of, because right now as we're recording it, we're still in the offseason. This has been one of the biggest questions of the entire offseason is, is what does Stefan Diggs have left in the tank? And if he's still Stefan Diggs, there is still a shot that he leads his team in receiving yards and targets and everything else. And then we're talking about what's the perceived roles for the other two guys in this offense, Tank Dell and Nico Collins. And how much 12 and 21 personnel is this team going to run? And is Tank Dell, because he's probably going to be the slot wide receiver this year, is he going to play a full-time role and what that looks like? So I, I don't hate the call by Fitz because, again, you look at two to three different wide receiver rooms in the NFL right now, Chicago and Houston being the big standouts, and we're all kind of saying, okay, we're throwing our hands up and saying, I, I don't know who's going to be the number one, the number two to number three this year so i'm not going to push back too hard against fits and say okay i know exactly how this is going to work out because it could work out exactly how fits is laying out here for those who missed it we did an episode that dropped on labor day this week um where we kind of asked some of our key questions for the fantasy season and i put those questions together and the number one question i wrote down was what ha happens with this receiving room right like i think i've said it all off season. i think it's one of the key questions that if you get it right on draft day you will set yourself up for real success during fantasy season is, is figuring out who was the right guy to target in this offense. Was there a right guy to target in this offense at cost and, and see how it plays out. Now, speaking of Nico Collins, you reference him here, Debro, in your next bold prediction. Yeah, we're talking about Nico Collins and how special his 2023 season. It was last year. Well, I'm going to give you the 2024 version of Nico Collins right now. And that is Christian Watson. 2024 Christian Watson will be 2023 Nico Collins. And I know everybody is, is crafting their hamstring jokes right now as you're listening to me. Save them because Christian Watson is going to bury and put all of those in a coffin with his performance this year. And what we saw last year in a very small sample, only two games where Jordan Love was playing elite type of uh, football, Christian Watson averaged 24 fantasy points per game almost had a 24% target share, and just crushed it in efficiency metrics. And we, this isn't the first time that we've seen Christian Watson do that. He did it in his rookie season. And we always talk about, okay, we need to invest in talented second-year wide receivers. Well, he wasn't able to stay healthy last year. If he stays healthy this year, we're going to see a monster season for Christian Watson. And we're talking about the efficiency. We're talking about the target volume. I think he is the clear... Wide receiver one for the Green Bay Packers. And Worm, you talked about earlier, anytime touchdown scoring bets. I already made one on the Betting Pros app already. And the odds have moved in my favor for Christian Watson to score an anytime touchdown in week one. I think I got it at plus 380, and that's down down to plus 175. So tail it if you wish. But this all comes down to Christian Watson is going to be amazing, and it starts week one. Yeah, I mean, the, the simplest way to look at this, Fitz, is, you know, what was the key to Nico Collins finally breaking out? It was he had a really good quarterback finally, and we're now going to see theoretically a healthy Christian Watson with a really good quarterback for the full season. I mean, it's very easy to paint that picture. You as a Packers fan, I'm sure are excited about Christian Watson as well this season. I am, and I'm most excited about his touchdown potential. We have seen him score touchdowns in bunches. As a rookie, he had eight over a four-game stretch. Last year, he had four over a three-game stretch. He's 6'4", with a big wig and span, so we could see him be a major red zone target for the Packers, and he has sub-4-4 four, four speed that really shows up on the field, so he can take it to the house from pretty much anywhere on the field. Like, this guy is a dangerous weapon, and I could easily see him scoring double-digit touchdowns. Are you ranking him as wide receiver one in Green Bay, or do you have Jaden Reed ahead of him? No, I have Watson highest. They're close. Not much separation. I think there may be three or four guys apart, but I do have Watson ranked highest. I believe I do as well, Debro. You already mentioned that you think he's wide receiver one in Green Bay, so I assume you also have it ranked that way? 
Yeah, I've got him at wide receiver 33 right now in, in uh, preseason ranks. And I think the closest guy I have to him is Jaden Reed at wide receiver 42. Yeah, I've got I've got Watson at 36 and Reed at like 39. So they're close, but I do have Watson mm-hmm. ahead as well. So we're all in agreement on that one. All right, Fitz, let's go to your number three bold prediction. What do you have for us? All right, well, so far, Debro has been all ice cream cones and puppy dogs, and I've been Mr. Salty here. <laughs> so I should probably come up with some sort of positive player prediction. And I'm going to say that Brock Bowers finishes as a top three fantasy tight end. Um, it was pretty much love at sight for me when I first saw Bowers suit up for uh, Georgia as an 18-year-old freshman. He just kept making plays for one of the best teams in the country, uh, ran like a wide receiver. I think the first time I ever saw him, he had it like a 90-yard catch and run against University of Alabama Birmingham really early in his freshman season, where he just uh, like basically outran defensive backs to the end zone. Um, and then he also looked like George Kittle after the catch, just bullying people and and being impossible to tackle. I was actually really sad when I learned that he was a freshman and we wouldn't be able to draft him in fantasy leagues until 2024 at the earliest. Well, friends, it is 2024 now. And uh, I've, I've drafted a whole bunch of Brock Bowers. I'm really excited about it. He is one of the best tight end prospects, if not the best tight end prospect to ever come into the league. Um, 882 receiving yards and 13 touchdowns in that freshman year at Georgia. Then as a sophomore, he goes out and wins the John Mackey Award as the best tight end in the country. Uh, Goes out and wins the Mackey Award again in his junior year. Fell out of the top 10 in this year's draft, and I think some teams are going to really regret passing on him. Um, Fast, has great hands, can get open against man or zone, Um, can be the ultimate Swiss Army uh, knife who lines up all over the place, in line, out wide, in the slot, in the backfield. A lot of people are kind of concerned about the Raiders quarterback situation, like letting the air out of Bowers tires in year one. But I mean, Gardner Minshew floated a 109 catch season for Michael Pittman last year. And even though the Colts had the most confusing tight end goulash in the NFL last year, all those tight ends still combined for 70 catches and 883 yards. So I don't know. My, my bigger concern, I guess, was Raiders offensive coordinator Luke Getze. Bowers is this ultimate chess piece. And I'm, you know, or at least was a little worried that Getze is a, a checkers player who wouldn't know how to use this chess piece. Well, Bowers played one preseason game and Getze moved him around all over the formation even at a target coming out of the backfield. I was really encouraged by that. We're coming off a season in which a rookie tight end, Sam Laporta, was the leading fantasy scorer at the position. Now, I'm not going to predict that we have two straight rookies as the top fantasy tight end, but I will predict that Bowers is among the top three tight ends in fantasy scoring. I'm glad you brought up Laporta because I was going to ask you, Fitz, are you putting a lot of weight into the fact that we just saw a rookie do this? And like Dalton, Dalton Kincaid to a lesser degree have a very good first year as well. Because typically prior to 2023, not that it never ever happens, but it's pretty rare for rookie tight ends to make an, an impact in year one. It's a position that lends itself to taking a couple of seasons for guys to really break out. So the fact that we just saw it last year in such a magnificent way from Laporta is that weighing on your mind as you make this bold prediction for Bowers? Because without that happening, it would be even kind of harder to buy into it, I feel like, just given that it doesn't really happen usually. Laporta's rookie year breakout does sort of encourage me to have this faith in Bowers, but really it's all about Bowers and the kind of prospect he is. Like, this dude is special. And, I mean, like... (sighs) We generally have these negative associations with Kyle Pitts because he's really let fantasy managers down the last couple of years. But he did come in as this heralded tight end prospect and have a thousand yard season. The first one we've seen by a rookie since Mike Ditka 60 years earlier. And Bowers is a better prospect than Pitts was. That's I know that you've been on that hill for a while, so it's not surprising for me to hear you say that. But it is still like I'm remembering just a few years ago how much everybody talked about Pitts as generational. So hearing somebody be called just a few years later better than him is is interesting. I know that's been your stance for a while. Debro, what are you expecting out of Bowers this year? I think he's going to be top 12. I think so. I'm going to give the easy avenue 
for Fitz's take to pay off. Devontae Adams gets traded to the New York Jets early in the season. And it opens up the entire target pie for Brock Bowers. And then Jacoby Myers falls in behind him as the number two option. And Bowers is the one that that's, that's the Avenue. Cause really, what are you talking about? Like outside of that, like Adams, we know is going to threaten for 160 plus targets. And without him in that, in that room and that passing game, it should be all Brock Bowers. And so like for, for Bowers, you know, we can talk a lot about like, how much is he gonna like? How much his snaps are gonna be? His routes per game? Is Luke Getzey gonna involve Michael Mayer? Is this more of a Dalton Kincaid situation and not a Sam Laporta situation? Yeah, we could talk about all of that, but I'm not gonna push back on Fitz as far as the legendary talent that Brock Bowers is. So <laughs> if the avenue for just monster target share gets opened up and Adams is gone, because we saw like anybody that's watched the Netflix series, he was not happy last year for the Raiders. So I'm not gonna rule out that he's uh, a a Las Vegas Raider for the entire year. Um, so yeah, that's the avenue of how this pays off. That sounds like a an eleventh bold prediction, D bro. That sounds like a bonus. <laughs> the Devontae hey, Adams trade. Can you imagine how upset the Garrett Wilson investors would be after oh. the, the quarterbacking they have dealt with the last two years? All of a sudden things are looking good. You've got Aaron Rodgers under center, Devontae Adams gets traded to the Jets. Oh. As a heavy Garrett Wilson investor myself, I would hate that. <laughs> <laughs> Fitz, did, didn't you? T- we're we're in the middle of a a slow draft uh, right now with on the content team. Um, didn't you take Wilson in that league? It's fourteen team league. I think yeah, you did. Yeah. Gary yeah. Wilson at yeah. the one ten. Yeah. So I've, you want to see the prediction come true, but do you want to see it bad enough <laughs> to sink the team, Fitzy? I don't think I do. I think I'm overweight on Gary Wilson this year, so that would that would not be a good one for me either. Yeah, I think it might be too. All right, Debra, what's your next bowl prediction? Oh, well, we've all, uh, speaking of guys, we've loved the entire offseason. I, I have not shut up about this guy since freaking January. Uh, so you're giving me an avenue where I can give a poll prediction about somebody. It's Jaleel McLaughlin, baby. He's going to be an RB2 in fantasy this year. And I push back about his offseason rankings, his upside, everything for the entire year. I'm not going to stop now. I, he was the king of efficiency last year. I mean, we're talking about a player that was legit top 15 and basically every tackle breaking metric that you could pull up he's getting has gotten the role that we want in this offense we want the receiving back in a sean payton offense we've talked about this the entire offseason sean payton's offense the last nine years with him coordinating an offense has never finished outside the top five actually fourth in targets to the running back position He's gotten red zone usage. He's gotten early down usage in the preseason. Been working in with Javante Williams. I don't know what anybody needs to, to see out of Jaleel at this point. All of the, the offseason buzz has been spectacular for him. Peyton's talking about he's the first guy in the building, the last one out. And for everybody out there, because I know you're going to talk, you're going to put it in the comments and tell me immediately that Jaleel McLaughlin is too small to pay off. He's too small to get that type of volume. I want you to use that same energy when you press the button on Devon Achan in drafts because they're like the same size. Actually, Julio McLaughlin has a higher BMI than Achan. So just as long as we're keeping that same energy and keeping it 100 here, if you're going to fade McLaughlin, who's free in drafts and going to crush this year, I want you to use that same energy on Achan. McLaughlin is definitely free in drafts, particularly in like home leagues. I, I was actually attending a live draft last night that I was not participating in. There was a lot of very casual um, kind of beginner players, as Fitz would call them, squares in that league. And uh, they decided that I couldn't participate because I was too much of a ringer doing this for my job. Uh, but it was at a friend's place. So I still showed up to the live draft, had some fun on Labor Day. But I, the, the rule was everybody was allowed to get one piece of advice from me throughout the draft and they could use me for kind of one round pick for everybody. And in the last round, I texted one of my friends. I was like, I don't know who you're about to take here. Take Jaleel McLaughlin. Like he's still available in round 17. Like there's, mm. just please take him. There's no business, you know, he has no business still being available. So I was- uh, 17? I know. It was only a 10 team league, Whoa. but like, yes, still. round 17. And I was like, dude, please take, he can't go undrafted. Um, so uh, I, I thought about you, D bro, when I made that recommendation. And I actually told him, I said, I have a coworker who thinks he's a top 24 running back this year. So um, I was right there with you, uh, giving that advice. Fitz, what are you doing with McLaughlin this year? 
Oh, drafting him in a lot of leagues. And pretty much the only time I don't come out of a draft with Jaleel McLaughlin is if I've already drafted Javante Williams earlier. Like I was going want... to bring that up, Fitz, because I know you were very high on Javante, and I was wondering oh, if that skewed how you like McLaughlin. I think it's going to be a two-man backfield, and the Broncos had a league-high 153 running back targets last year. Only one other team was over 131. So, like, targets galore. I think the stat that J.J. Zacharyson, our, our buddy over at late round uh, quarterback, sorry, I know that's his, is that his site now, whatever. J.J. is an awesome guy, and he pointed out that I think since 2011, the 20 highest of the 20 highest running back target shares in the NFL, eight of them had been Sean Payton offenses. Like his backs always catch a ton of passes. Oh, and by the way, Bo Nix was a total check down machine throughout his college career. So like there are going to be targets galore. And by the way, uh, Jaleel McLaughlin is the all time leading NCAA rusher. He has over 8,000 rushing yards in his career. Granted, he did get a fifth year due to COVID. Uh, I think he played his first two at Notre Dame and then transferred to Youngstown State. But like, this guy is good. Like, he graded out really well last year, uh, super efficient, and he's going to catch a lot of passes, as is Javante this year for Denver. Like, I want a piece of the Denver backfield. Debra, are you shying away from Javante at all because you like Joey Lowe so much, or are you also investing in both? Uh, so I will say that I, I've jumped. I've- bumped up Javante a ton in my ranks as we've kind of gone through the off season. Like I had Jaleel above Javante uh, at the earlier part of the off season, but now with the positive buzz about Javante as well, I mean, Peyton said he's in camp. He's looking great. He's shed some weight from last year, looking like a different player. Uh, right now I have Javante at RB 25 and I have Jaleel McLaughlin at RB 33. Um, so really, I mean, both these guys I'm looking at as RB threes because of the, the complexion of the Denver Broncos offense. If you were to tell me that not only does, we know a lot of the red zone offense is going to run through the backfield, but if this offense surprises, I don't want to give a 12th bold prediction here, but (laughs) if this offense does surprise, I have them both ranked as RB threes. If this offense surprises, if both of them finish inside of the top 24 running backs, I really would not be surprised. Debro, Javante obviously has an injury history, If and we certainly don't want him to get hurt. If he does go down, would you be even more aggressive ranking Jaleel, or do you think— I would. Yep. Okay. Yeah, so would you have him much closer? I, I would, I would, and not to cut you off, Worm, I would in the sense that I think Estime would take over the early down role, but okay. That's we would have a path that. for Jaleel— to eat into that because I think that if you're looking just from a, a sheer talent uh, perspective, I think Javante is a better runner and a better player than Audric Estime. So I think that he could eat into the early down workload even more than what we probably see for Javante. Anybody who knows me knows there's basically nothing in the world I love more than going to baseball games all summer long. In fact, just this last weekend, I went to all three games. I was talking about it for so long on these shows that I was going to be going to these games. I finally went to all three of the Orioles games here in Denver. The O's did take the series two games to one. It was super fun. By the way, shouts again. I already thanked him, but shouts again to Danny Coulomb, Orioles relief pitcher, for hooking me up with uh, batting practice field passes. It was an awesome experience. Also, shouts to Jared, a listener to the show, who hooked me up with tickets on one of the nights as well, down close to the uh, Orioles dugout. So that was a really cool experience as well. Always love meeting fans, especially fans who are also Orioles fans like myself. Um, but for the games that I had to get my own tickets, I used Game time with killer last minute deals, all in prices, views from your seat, and their lowest price guarantee. Game time takes the guesswork out of buying MLB tickets. I'll be planning ahead for the O's, or I did plan ahead for the O's series, of course. But one of my favorite things about game time is the last minute deals. You can save up to 60% off buying last minute for not just sports, but concerts, comedy, theater, and more. I went to a concert at Red Rocks earlier this summer as well. And you can be sure I checked out game time's deals for that at the last second as we decided to go. We're not very good about planning ahead for the concerts as much as I am with the uh, baseball games. Two other features that I love for how much it takes the frustration out of ticket buying are game time seat views, showing your view from the seat before you buy, and all-in pricing, so I know the total upfront with no hidden fees. Game time is simple to use, but more importantly, the app gives me all the information I need to make an easy ticket purchase. So this summer, take the guesswork out of buying MLB tickets with Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code Fantasy Pros for twenty dollars off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem code F A N T A S Y P R O S for twenty dollars off 
Download Game Time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. All right, Debo, give me your number two bold prediction. Well, again, investing in offenses that we love this year. Brian Robinson Jr. will be this year's Alfred Morris. He will be an RB1 in fantasy. And I know everybody's so concerned about the offensive line. Everybody's so concerned about this offense in general. I'm not. I think he's going to get the goal line roll. And what are we seeing out of a Cliff Kingsbury offense from 2019 to 2021? They were eighth in red zone rushing rate. We also remember, and, and again, I know this has been a few years, boys, but in 2021, when James Conner was second in the NFL and rushing attempts inside the five, the previous year, Kenyon Drake was third in the NFL and rushing attempts inside the five. We know that the commanders are going to run a ton of plays. They're going to be probably one of the fastest paced offenses in the NFL. We talked about this earlier. Volume is king, and that's going to lead volume to the running game. And you have the added efficiency boost of Daniels with his legs and opening up RPOs and space for Brian Robinson Jr. On top of it, we don't give Brian Robinson Jr. enough credit for how good he was last year. I don't think many people understand he was a top 24 running back in fantasy points per game last year, as well as top 20 in most tackle-breaking metrics. Yeah, I love the Commanders this year, and I love Brian Robinson Jr. I have also loved the Commanders this year. Um, I've been very excited about Terry McLaurin. I've been very excited about Brian Robinson. Fitz, where did you end up ranking Robinson for the season? I think like wide receiver, uh, running back 25. And um, I've come around on him. I, I kind of thought early in his career that he was just a, a ham and egger. But like he is better than that. And I like him for a lot of the same reasons. Debro likes him. It's going to be a fast-paced offense. And we know that... It's generally a pretty good thing for running backs who have dangerous running quarterbacks that they're playing with because it sort of spikes their efficiency. And we've seen a number of cases where this has happened. And I think this could happen with Brian Robinson. Maybe he is indeed the uh, 2024 version of 2012 Alfred Morris. I couldn't get him inside the top 20. I did end up having Robinson RB 21. So, so pretty close and well inside that RB two range. I, I wanted to be aggressive on him. Um, like I said, same with Terry McClure. And those are really the two guys in addition to Daniels that I'm, I'm really banking on in this offense. And, and I just think we're pretty much undervalued the entire draft season. Like I was mm -hmm. so comfortable. I wanted to get one good running back early. And then I was so comfortable waiting several rounds to take my second because I knew it, I had a really good chance of getting Robinson in pretty much every draft. And if you're telling me he can be my RB2 paired with, you know, one of these elite guys, I'm really excited about that. So um, I totally agree with you here, Debro. Uh, Fitz, let's go to your number two bold prediction for the season. I'm going to go back to being a sour po uh, sourpuss and, and having people mad at me. So I'm going to say Rasheed Rice does not finish as a top 40 wide receiver this season. Um, as the, the summer has gone on and, and people have realized there's a good chance Rasheed Rice is not going to serve any sort of 2024 suspension for the high speed hit and run crash he was involved in earlier this year, um, or at least not during the... 2024 season like there's probably a suspension coming at some point but there has been this spike in enthusiasm when people realize that they're probably not going to lose games with Rasheed Rice um, he's now up to wide receiver 25 in ECR I was just in two drafts where he was wide receiver 22 and wide receiver 20 so like he is the price has been rising pretty steadily I'm not saying the enthusiasm is completely unfounded. Like Rice was really good as a rookie, 79 catches, 938 yards, seven touchdowns in the regular season, plus that big game against Miami in the playoffs. Uh, in the icy conditions, he had 130 yards and a touchdown. Patrick Mahomes is his quarterback. Andy Reid is his play caller. What isn't to like? Well, I think it was largely out of necessity the Rice played this big role for the Chiefs last year. Like, they had no one at wide receiver who could get open downfield. Justin Watson was their most dangerous downfield threat. They had Sky Moore, Marquez Valdez-Scantling, Kadarius Toney all getting meaningful snaps. I mean, yikes. So the Chiefs adjusted, and, uh, you know, like, Mahomes threw a lot of little wide receiver screens and, and hitches to Rice. They threw 69 screen passes to wide receivers and tight ends last year. No other team had more than 51 screens to wide receivers and tight ends. And uh, they had 53 
screen passes to wide receivers alone, most of them going to Rice. Easy completions, and then Rice would do his best Debo Samuel imitation after the catch. And hey, I mean, Rice undeniably did really well in that role. He was terrific after the catch. Average depth of target, though, just 4.8 yards. So now the Chiefs go out and they bring in two wide receivers who have blazing speed and can get open downfield, Hollywood Brown and Xavier Worthy. So these guys are going to do a much better job than Sky Moore and Marquez Valdez-Scantling of getting open downfield. And, you know, like they've got Travis Kelsey, too, by the way, still, you know, one of the the best pass catching tight ends of all time. So everyone seems blind to the possibility of this reduction in target volume for Rasheed Rice. Over his last 10 games last year, playoffs included, Rice averaged 8.9 targets a game. I am confidently betting the under and Rice averaging 8. 8.9 8.9 targets a game this year. It's it's going to be less than that. No question about it. Um, like when Rice can also throw to Kelsey, Hollywood Brown, Xavier Worthy, the target share is inevitably going to decrease and, and possibly dramatically for Rasheed Rice. So while some people are predicting that Rice is going to be a top 20 or top 25 receiver this year, I am making the bold prediction that Rice doesn't finish in the top 40. So my apology to all Rasheed Rice stakeholders who are undoubtedly cursing me right now. I was surprised to see this one fits because I have been among the group that is more enthusiastic about Rice as it's become more apparent that the suspension is not going to you know, take effect this season. Um, I know Erickson, who's obviously not on this episode, has been really aggressive about Rice since that you know has kind of become more apparent as well. Uh, I get the case that you're making. There obviously are more mouths to feed. I think Rice is a good player, though, and like there is just more of a level of familiarity with Mahomes than he will have with Hollywood or Worthy. So I- I'm still interested in Rice. I mean, again, it's it's a bold prediction, so it's not like you're saying this is like an obviously easy thing. Um, but but deeper, I'm curious if you were surprised like me to see Fitz include this on this list. I, I was surprised to see it, but I, I know Fitzy has not been a a big fan of his usage and and not just saying like, it's all like, you know, gimmicky, but a lot of design stuff, a lot of screens. So, I mean, I I definitely get where Fitz is coming from. For me, this kind of hinges on two, two different things for, for rice to should I say, I'm not going to say pay off on this prediction, but for this prediction to come true. And it comes down to, I, I think you need Hollywood to be on the field and very productive and the touchdowns to go other ways. And, this is not saying that, you know, Patrick Mahomes is going to have a bad season, but is Travis Kelsey, does he bounce back and is he just legendary again this year? Because we saw him take a small step back. Some of that may be due to injuries and stuff and as well as extra defensive attention the entirety of the season. So does Kelsey bounce back? Is Hollywood able to stay healthy and come back and be uh, like immensely productive? And do we get more rushing touchdowns if I, out of Isaiah Pacheco? I mean, really... There's a path for this coming true where even Rasheed Rice doesn't get suspended and he stays healthy. Now, I'm a believer in Rasheed Rice. I have him ranked right now as my wide receiver 27. So I'm not in the same camp as Fitzy, but we want to draw up, okay, how does the season play out and how do the predictions and a reasonable avenue to how they come true? There's a lane where this does happen. Manage your fantasy football lineups and dominate your leagues with My Playbook from Fantasy Pros. My Playbook is a suite of powerful tools to help you make better decisions, manage your lineups, and win your leagues. Created by the Fantasy Pros, the number one fantasy sports advice and tools provider in the world, this app will let you import your team to get custom fantasy football news, rankings, and analysis. So sync your leagues today at fantasypros.com slash myplaybook or download the Fantasy Football My Playbook app. All right, Debra, we've got one bold prediction each. What is your number one bold prediction for the entire 2024 season? Okay, so I'm not going to blow anybody's socks off by saying that Justin Jefferson is a really, really good player or that he's super talented. We all know that. But since J.J. McCarthy got hurt, lost for the entire season, and Sam Darnold is now the quarterback for the Minnesota Vikings, everybody has been pumping the brakes on Justin Jefferson. And we've seen him fall in some drafts, maybe towards the back end of the first round. And I'm here to tell everybody that the hate needs to stop. We need to get on the train and get in the boat with Justin Jefferson because I think that this year he becomes only the fourth 
wide receiver in NFL history to get over 200 targets in an NFL season, and he threatens to break the single-season receiving yardage record. And I know that you're all going to talk about, okay, well, Sam Darnold's not that good. I just need Sam Darnold to be just about as good as he was last time we saw him for Carolina in 2022. When we saw him last as a starter, he was eighth in yards per attempt. KOC is a really good play caller. And and I think everybody's also missing the boat on Justin Jefferson last year. And we got a microcosm of two different splits here. One with Kirk Cousins and one without. With Kirk Cousins, Justin Jefferson was on pace. And I get it was only a four-game sample. But this, I think we're not understanding the type of volume that Jefferson is going to see this year. In the four games he got with Kirk, he was on pace for 200 targets, 140 receptions, and 2,300 receiving yards. Now we go towards the end of the season with Nick Mullins under center, because that's the other out here. If Sam Darnold sucks, we've seen what it looks like with Nick Mullins, and that means a lot of YOLO ball, and he's not going to give a crap, and he's going to throw it up for Justin Jefferson. Weeks 15 through 18 last year, that four-game sample, Justin Jefferson was on pace for 187 targets, so not far off of 200. It was on pace for over 2,000 receiving yards. So both sides of this split, Justin Jefferson still on pace for 2,000 receiving yards and knocking on the door of 200 targets. So we'll talk about quarterback play. You have outs here. Sam Darnold's not good. We got Nick Mullins. We've seen what that looks like. We don't have any other high-end target share earners in the Vikings offense right now. I'm sorry. Jordan Addison, unless he takes a step forward from what he showed last year, is not that guy. He was outside the top 45 or 50 wide receivers in basically every single target drawing efficiency metric out there. TJ Hawkinson, when do we see him? And then what are we talking about for the rest of this passing attack? Jalen Naylor? Aaron Jones? That's it? There is nothing to stop Justin Jefferson from eating 11 to 12 targets every single game. And if we get league average quarterback play out of whoever the heck is under center, Jefferson is paying off on this prediction this year. I've had Jefferson pretty firmly in my wide receiver four spot behind Lamb, Chase, and Hill for most of the mm -hmm. you know this draft season. And given everything going on with Chase and the holdout and not practicing, I'm starting to feel like that might be a mistake and maybe was overreacting a bit to the quarterback difference, you know, in Minnesota with Jefferson. Um, I'm starting to wish I had maybe taken a bit more Jefferson than I have. Uh, because I think you're right. Like I think Sam Darnold doesn't need to be the best quarterback in football for Jefferson to be a really, really successful fantasy draft pick, right? He just needs to not be the worst quarterback in football. And I think in this offense with Kevin O'Connell running things, that can be the case where he's just not the worst. And therefore, that's enough for the best wide receiver in football to look like the best wide receiver in football. Uh, Fitz, where did you end up having Jefferson ranked? And what do you think about this prediction from Debro? I mean, right now, wide receiver three, because I've got Jamar Chase behind him because I'm yeah. yep. starting to worry I'm about Jefferson up to wide receiver two. I want to be transparent about that. CD CD is the only guy that I have above Jefferson right now. Yeah. So I'm I'm like Debra. I'm not pumping the brakes on Justin Jefferson. I'm taking that turn at 80 miles an hour. And part of it is that I'm not scared of Sam Darnold as, as a quarterback. And like Sam Darnold has supported a couple of really nice seasons for DJ Moore in the past. And Kevin O'Connell is by far the best play caller that Sam Darnold will have ever played for. I mean, like, look at the competition, Adam Gase and Matt Rule. And this is going to be the best supporting cast, I think, that Sam Darnold has ever had. So uh, let's give Sam Darnold a collective mulligan here in fantasy football and uh, believe that he can make this offense go, because I, I do. Fitz. Take us home with your number one bold prediction for the season. Jonathan Taylor rushes for 2,000 yards and finishes as the RB1 in fantasy. Um, so Taylor's missed 13 games the last two years with injuries, but the injuries were relatively minor, a couple of ankle injuries and a uh, torn thumb ligament. The last time we got a full season out of JT in 2021, he had 1,811 rushing yards and 20 touchdowns. Now, Taylor gets to play with Anthony Richardson, one of the most dangerous running quarterbacks in the league. And we know that running quarterbacks spike the efficiency of their running backs. We saw it with Lamar Jackson 
and Gus Edwards. We saw it with Jalen Hurts and Miles Sanders, who had a couple of really good years with with uh, Hurts at quarterback. And perhaps the most ex- uh, most famous example of all, and we referenced it a little while ago, Alfred Morris, 2012, when Robert Griffin III took the league by storm. Fellow rookie Alfred Morris, a sixth round draft pick with four six seven speed, rolled up sixteen hundred rushing yards and thirteen rushing touchdowns. Jonathan Taylor is a far far better running back than Gus Edwards, Miles Sanders, or Alfred Morris. Uh, when when Colts head coach Shane Steichen calls run pass option plays, defenders are going to have to figure out whether Anthony Richardson is actually going to hand Taylor the football when he goes to stick the ball in, in Taylor's bread basket, or is he going to pull it out and throw or run it himself? Any hesitation by defenders is going to give Taylor an edge, uh, less penetration by defenders, bigger rushing lanes. And speaking of Shane Steichen, we know he likes to play fast. The Colts had the fastest paced offense in the league last season, averaging a league low 24 seconds between offensive snaps the Colts have a good offensive line. There's a big season coming down the pike for Jonathan Taylor if he can stay healthy. And I'm going to predict that Jonathan Taylor goes absolutely ham in 2024, has a 2,000-yard rushing season. Eat your heart out, Chris Johnson. <laughs> yeah, that um, I, I love the Taylor call. I've been all over him. I, I thought he was the easy RB4, and I thought he was the easy ninth pick in drafts. Like there was kind of that clear one, two, three at running back, and kind of the clear top five at receiver that in some order was the top eight in most of the drafts I participated in. To me, I felt like it was a top nine, not a top eight. And I do think Taylor was ninth of that group, but like I just, I was really excited to get him if I was in the back half of drafts this season. You know, th- that 2021 season, I, I wonder if like historically is maybe a little underrated. Since 2017, the only running back to have more fantasy points in a season by half PPR scoring than that 2021 Jonathan Taylor was is Christian McCaffrey. He's done it twice. And even last year, McCaffrey's season was only four points better than Jonathan Taylor's 2021, again, in half PPR scoring. Like it was a great, great season. And you're right, it's largely just been the injuries that have been an issue since then. And he's still young enough that he's still like, obviously it's not like he's on like the back nine of his career, right? Like he's still a very good running back. I would expect in what should be an awesome situation for him. So I totally agree with you, Fitz. I I love the, you know, again, I've been getting Taylor a lot because I thought he was even just by a couple of spots kind of undervalued for a lot of this draft season. Debro, I know that according to our current rankings, I don't know if you've changed this. You don't have him as RB4. You have Gibbs ahead of him. Is that Mm -hmm. still the case? And you just have him in the top five. It's not like you're fading Taylor. No, I'm not fading him. I I firmly had Taylor ahead of Saquon Barkley, and I think when people have been in drafts, those are the two names they're kind of parsing between uh, a lot of different times. I've had Taylor over Barkley the entire offseason, basically, and I will continue to have it that way. Um, So, yeah, I I love this call by Fitzy. I mean, just this boils down to, like, over the last few years, we talk about the best pure rushing talents in the NFL before the injury – I mean, that conversation began and pretty much ended with Nick Chubb and Jonathan Taylor. So to tell me that, like, we get JT fully healthy and this offense for the Colts just takes flight this year. I mean, we could be looking at a similar season. So I don't hate this at all. Fitz, if you think that Jonathan Taylor is going to run for 2,000 yards and you are a Wisconsin Badger, why aren't you drafting him number one overall? (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I probably should be, but um, why didn't you draft him over Garrett Wilson in this draft, Fitzy? Oh, he, he got sniped in front of me directly above. Oh, that's right. Yeah, Bogman Scott took him. Bogman, oh. yeah. I've, I've See, I'm it. sitting here talking smack, and I didn't even remember the uh, the particulars. Yeah, thank you for rem- reminding me to curse out Bogman next time I see him, bro. <laughs> Appreciate that. This uh, this draft, by the way, has been like I've just for whatever reason this year I haven't had many large drafts. It's been mostly twelve teams, the Ooh. occasional ten team. I haven't really done a lot of fourteen team leagues and bigger. And so, not only that, it's a fourteen team league, but against pretty much our whole content team, both, you know, on camera and behind the scenes. Everybody in this league is really sharp. Everybody in this it's league brutal. knows all the players that we like. Um, I have found this to be quite a brutal draft of not getting the guys I want and feeling like my team is not very good. Yeah, the the the, the two the one two punch of the fact that not only is it the entire content team and everybody knows who everybody else likes, it's the fact that it's a 14 teamer too. So it's like 
Um, and and at Worm, you were at the one what the one oh six. Fitzy yeah. was at the the one ten. I drew the one twelve. So like. The entirety of this draft, it's like, okay, well, if I want to get any guys that I like, I'm yeah. just going to have to talk, take ADP and just toss it out the window. Because if not, <laughs> the players are not going to come back to me. Just how it is. I took Chase in this league. It's it's a slow draft, so it's been going on for a while now. And I was still at the time more optimistic about Chase being back in time for week one. And I took him and Erickson oh. took uh, Justin Jefferson right after me. And I regret that. I wish I had gone the other direction. It's one of many regrets in a, in a league like this. So it'll be, it'll be fun. We'll, we'll bring it up occasionally on the show throughout this year, uh, how we're doing in this league. Cause it's going to be a fun one. It's, it's us, it's Bogman, it's Erickson, it's Joey P it's Kelly Kirby. It's Mike Mayer. It's our producers. It's our graphics guy. It's Terrell. It's, it's going to be, it's Sam Hoppin to everybody's in this league. So it's going to be a lot of fun. Um, and, uh, we'll, we'll see who comes out on top in that one. This season is going to be really fun. Week one is going to be really fun. I'm so excited that we're here for the 2024 season. I always say this, like by the time we get to September, it feels like I've been thinking about the season for so long that when it finally hits, it almost is surreal. It's like, oh yeah, like I get to actually watch football. Like I'm, it's not just in my mind, in my imagination. And then I'm just really excited for it. So I hope everybody else is really excited too and really excited for the uh, you know the podcast this year because I think it's going to be awesome. So looking forward to doing more show, shows with you boys. I appreciate everybody for listening. For Debro and Fitz, I'm Ryan Warmly. We'll see you again next time.